Let's open up to 2 Samuel, please. Chapter 3. We were introduced to several characters last week, and uh, we'll continue to get to know them better <laughs> as we go through here. Uh -uh. So let's go ahead and start in chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Sons were born to David in Hebron, and his first was Ammon, Amnon, and then he gives this whole list of all the kids that he had during the time, during the seven-year period there that he was there. Um, every one of them has a, a different mom, which is kind of interesting. I think we looked at that a little bit. And so it was in verse 6, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. You might remember Abner was the commander, and he also had a little run-in with Ishbosheth. Ishbosheth was Saul's son, and Saul's son was in line for the throne. Since his brothers had been killed and, and the king was dead, his other son, Ishbosheth, was the one who should rightfully rule in um, Israel. And but uh, Abner has some different plans, and he's a military guy. Um, he kind of manipulates Ishbosheth and intimidates him and causes him to be afraid. And literally, he almost creates a coup in their nation when he goes in and he takes Saul's concubine, Rizpah, and takes her for his own when she should have been handed down to Saul's son, Ishobeth. So this is like a coup going on, and Abner and him get into it uh, about these uh, happenings that took place, and Abner just totally intimidates him, and uh, Ishbosheth has to just kind of keep his silence um, uh, concerning it. So let's jump down to verse 12. It said, Abner sent messages on his behalf to David, who was in the land, saying also, Make a covenant with me, and indeed my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel to you. And David said, Good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, you shall not see my face, unless you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. So David sent messengers to Isbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michal whom I betrothed myself, you might remember this story, for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. You guys remember that? <clears throat> quite, a, a, quite a present there. And so Ishbosheth sent, and he took her from her husband, Patil, Paltiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went along with her to Baharim, weeping behind her. And so... Abner said to him, go and return. And so he returned. That's the dear John letter that the fellow got. You know, your wife's gone. She's no longer going to be your wife. Um, go home. Quit your sniveling. Get over it. <laughs> and he kind of cold-hearted, didn't he? So Abner had communicated with the elders of Israel, saying in times past, you were looking for David to be the king over you. Now then, do it. For the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people from the hand of the Philistines and the hand of all their enemies. So Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin. And then Abner also went to speak in the hearing of David in Hebron. All that seemed good to Israel and the whole house of Benjamin. So just a little clarification here now. Israel would be all the tribes with the exception of Judah. Um, Judah was, the tribe of Benjamin and Judah were brought together. So when they're speaking of Benjamin, they're actually talking of the tribe of Judah there, where David had already been anointed king. So he's the king of Judah, but he's not the king of Israel. Abner has usurped 
um, Ishbosheth his throne and Abner pretty much, while Ishbosheth is a puppet. Do you think you could have a puppet for a king or can you have a puppet for a president? Uh huh. So you can get an idea of what's going on here, right? Abner's got an agenda. He wants to make peace with David, but again, Abner has an agenda. And he's saying all the things that really sound good. It's going to be great for us, you know. We're going to prosper, and you're going to win over all your enemies. We'll have a great economy. We'll have peace. Hmm, sounds so familiar. Isn't it weird how things go in circles through time? Huh? We never learn, do we? How many times did the children of Israel go around the mountain? Forty years they traveled around the mountain. And they didn't learn a thing. I've heard people say, you know, I've been around the block so many times, it's round. <laughs> right? And that's kind of how we are. We're really stubborn, boneheaded people. We have a hard time learning. Now, David, he's fallen for it. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace. We're going to pull it all together and make one big unit. At that moment, the servants of uh, David and Joab came from a raid and they brought much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away and he had gone in peace. Now when Joab and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he sent him away, and he's gone in peace. Now who's Joab? Joab is his, David's commander, his military guy. Joab came to the king, and he said, what have you done? You've been, you've been taken advantage of. Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away? Has he already gone? Surely you realize that Abner the son of Ner came to deceive you, and to know you're going out. And you're coming in, and to all to know all that you are doing, he was a spy. And when Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner, who brought him back from the well of Sariah, or Sirah. But David did not know it. Now, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately. Abner, I'd like to have a little bit of a chat with you. Come on outside, let's have a little talk. So he takes him outside, and he stabs him in the stomach. And he died for the blood of Ashahel, his brother. Because Abner had killed Ashahel in battle when Israel and Judah were fighting with one another. And now Abner, he's taken his revenge. And... Uh, it's interesting, in the King James, it words it a little, this is the new King James. The older King James says that he, he stabbed him with a knife below the fifth rib. Which would have meant that he went up underneath that fifth rib and right into the heart. Killed him instantly. The kill shot, if you will. So afterwards, when David heard about it, he said, My kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all his father's house. And let there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or is a leper or who leans on a staff or falls by the sword or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had killed their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. So David's kind of co-signing for it in a way. He says, this isn't my fault. I didn't do this, but I'm sure glad he did it. And I'm just hoping there'll be blessing upon him. You know, that he won't have lame descendants, that they won't have to have a cane, they won't have discharge or, le or a leper. Uh, some of these things are quite gross when you dig into them, so we're not going to. <coughs> Excuse me. And then verse 31, David says to Joab and to all the people that are with him, Tear your clothes, gird yourself with sackcloth and mourn for Abner. And King David followed the coffin. 
And so they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and he wept at the grave of Abner and all the people wept. And the king said, sang a lament over Abner and he said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put into fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. In other words, you weren't killed in battle, you weren't killed honorably, you were kind of careless and you were actually killed, and you didn't even know it was coming. You had no clue. He died as a fool dies. Interesting here that David is following the coffin. He's in the funeral process, and it says that David cried. He wept over the grave of Abner. And then as a little added thing in there, it says, and, and all the people wept. Well, of course. <laughs> if the king's weeping, you better be weeping too, right? Don't you think? They probably didn't, a lot of them probably didn't even know, care about Abner, but the king's weeping, so we better weep too. A lot of power. And then all the people wept over him again. So that's the end of our friend Abner. Now, Abner and David had a relationship when Saul was still alive. Abner was Saul's military guy, and David knew him very well. So he's, just as he did with King Saul, you might remember the man that came and told him that he had killed King Saul, did he give him gold and riches and reward for what he did? No, he killed him. He killed him. He came to David saying, hey man, I took his head and I took his stuff and his crown and I'm a hero. And... David said, no, you're not a hero. You've killed the Lord's anointed and told the soldier, strike him down. And they assassinated him on the spot, executed him. Because David had a great respect for the office. David had a great respect for the calling of God. Now, I want to just throw this in because I think it might be um, beneficial for us. Have you ever thought maybe you had a calling of God on your life? And maybe things didn't work out real well for you. And you kind of gave up on it. Or maybe, well, maybe you walked away from the Lord for a while. And you think, now because I've walked away, I'll never be able to fulfill the calling that God has put on my life. Because I blew it. And I want you to know that that's not true. First of all, if you truly are born again, you truly have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you will always be a child of God. You might be a disobedient child of God. You might be suffering the consequences of terrible decisions that you made that weren't God's will. But you're still a child of God. And if you come to the cross and you repent, everything will be restored with the exception of the consequences that we have to suffer for our actions. There was a young girl, a high school girl, raised in a Christian family, but she was kind of rebellious and she wanted to hang out with all of her friends who were experimenting with alcohol and drugs and things like kids, you know, or peer pressure got on her and she had a boyfriend and she winds up getting pregnant by this boyfriend and her family is like strict Christian family. And she's trying to hide it. She doesn't want them to know because she's afraid of what might happen to her. Well, you know, she gets to a point where you really can't hide it very well. So she had to go to her parents and confess what had happened. The boy is long gone. He has no accountability there. And she feels so condemned and so much of a failure and so sinful. In her heart, she believes that God has rejected her and disowned her. So her mom and dad try to explain God's grace and forgiveness and what repentance is. 
and they take her to the pastor of their church. And they all sit down together, and she's sharing her heart about how she feels despondent and ashamed. And the pastor says, you know, I do believe God can forgive us of the worst sin, you know. As a matter of fact, Jesus said all kinds of sin, all of it can be forgiven. There's only one sin that can't be forgiven. And it's not saying the Lord's name in a cuss word. That's not the one. The only sin that can't be forgiven man is when he rejects the gift of salvation given by Jesus Christ. If you reject God's salvation through Jesus, you have no way to cover your sin. So that is the one sin that God will not forgive. Will he forgive adultery? Yes. Will he forgive murder? Yes. Will he forgive Bad conduct? Yes. Pastor wants the little girl to know that, and he's trying to encourage her, and she's saying, well, here I am, nine months pregnant. And so they pray. And Pastor says, you know, I believe God's forgiven you, and you have repented, and I want you to start finding your way back. You are forgiven of your sin. But here's a life lesson for you, okay? As a result of your sin... You will have a child. And every time you look at that child, you're going to be reminded of your sin. That's the consequences of your sin. So sometimes, while I can be forgiven of my sin, the consequence of that sin will remain. That's an important lesson for us to learn. Because many times we get on that teeter we get on that edge where we're floundering and we're thinking, man, I've just gone too far. You know, God can't forgive me. Yes, he can. He wants to. And he will. So I had to throw that out there because um, we're going to see a lot of that going on as we learn more and more about David and his life. Do you think God approved of him having so many kids from all different women? Was that something you think God said, oh yeah, you're a king, just go ahead and have as many wives as you want? Hmm? Think that was God's will? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, he warned them in Leviticus not to do that. And today when you see these stupid shows on TV, you know, where they got four or five wives and, you know, they look all happy and content and harmony and all, that's a big fat lie. It doesn't work. We weren't meant, thank God, fellas, we weren't meant to have more than one. Hallelujah. So even though Abner wasn't such a great guy, you know, David is showing respect for him here. He's showing respect for the office. Now, here's a passage I wanted to throw out to you when I got off on that tangent a second ago. This is what the Bible says. The callings and the gifts of God come without repentance. Think about that. You know what that means? That's not repentance on our part. He's talking about repentance on God's part. When God calls you and I to a job, a ministry, a calling, whatever it might be, he knows exactly every single thing that's going to happen in your life from that moment forward. He's not surprised. You know, when you, when you don't read your Bible for three days in a row, he's not going, Oh, I'm so disappointed. I thought he was the right person, but you know. No, he already knew that. He called you in spite of that. That can even get worse. God knows the people that he's calling. And one way or another, he brings us to that place where we have an opportunity to fulfill our destiny in him. Even though we're flawed, even though we make mistakes, I want to encourage you because some of you might be in that same place right now. You might be thinking, you know, I think God's calling me to go out and do such and such. And then maybe you're thinking, oh, maybe I can't do that because look at who I am. Who am I to be able to do something like that? Well, if God's called you, then move forward and watch him bless it. So let's go on. 
I apologize for going on the off ramp there, but. <clears throat> So, verse 35, when all the people came to persuade David to eat food while it was still day, David took an oath and said, God, do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else until the sun goes down. Now all the people took note of it, and it pleased them. <laughs> Since whatever the king did pleased the people. That's a good way to be, you know, have a good relationship with the king. You know? First they come to him and they say, come on and eat something, David. And he says, well, I'm not going to eat all day long. And they say, that's very noble of you, David. Awesome. We approve of that. Right? So the people understood that day that it had never been the king's intent to kill Abner, the son of Ner, which it was not. And the king said to his servants, do you not know that a prince... And a great man has fallen this day in Israel. Am I weak today, though anointed king? And these men, the sons of Zeruah, Zeruiah, are too harsh for me? The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Thank the Lord for that. We were just praying about that tonight. You can take heart in knowing the Lord will repay the evildoer, according to his wickedness. And when Saul's son heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost heart. And all of Israel was troubled. He was their leader. Now, Saul's son had two men who were captains of troops. The name of one was Baana, and the name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Rimon. And he was a Berothite. And he was of the children of Benjamin, because the Beeroth, for Beeroth, their father, was also a part of Benjamin. So interesting, this fellow Baana, the how are you going to pronounce it? We'll pronounce it like that. His name means son of grief. How would you like to have that name? Interesting. You know, when there was things going on, current events, children were born and they were named along with some of the events that were going on in their history at the time. Dad must have been going through some hard times, Berothite, Beeroth. And so Beeroth names his son, son of grief. Because the Beerites fled to get him and have been so journeys until this day. Now it's also an interesting thing to know that um, Beeroth and Baana, the son of grief, are direct descendants of Hem. Sham, Hem, Japheth. Who are they? Who's Jam and Hem and Japheth? Je no, it's three sons. So here we see one of his offspring and their family bloodline here coming into play here. Um, and they were sojourners. They were actually, I was reading on this a little bit. These people actually dwelt in this land all the way from the time of Abraham. So they had been there for a long time. Verse 4, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son. And he was lame in his feet. That's a so sad story. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the only remaining offspring from Jonathan. And when Saul and Jonathan were killed on the battlefield, which would have been at least maybe eight or ten years earlier than this. So if he's five years old when that happened, he could be a young 13 year, 14 year old uh, young man by now. But he's been in hiding. He's been stashed away. They've been hiding him because they're afraid that because he's a direct bloodline from the king, his life is in danger and he can't defend himself. And his name was Mephibosheth. 
And then the sons of Remon the Berethite, Rechab and Baana, sat out and came at about the heat of the day into the house of Ishbosheth, who was lying on his bed at noon. And they came there all the way into the house as though to get wheat. And they stabbed him below the fifth rib in the stomach. And then Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. So why did they do that? Well, Ishbosheth was the man in line for Saul's throne. He was the son. Now, since um, Abner's gone now, this is the only remaining heir besides uh, his lame son, but this is the only heir left. These guys are thinking, again, like the men that killed Saul, we're going to go and kill this dude, remove that threat, and man, David's going to make us heads of state and we'll be rich for the rest of our lives. We're going to do good for him. And so once again, look how they did it. It wasn't even an honorable kill. That's what, you know, he was probably sleeping. And they crept up on him really quiet and just stuck him. And they escaped. And look what else they did. They beheaded him. Now, it even gets worse. In the old King James, it says they cut off his hands and his feet and beheaded him. Are these people vicious or what? We see that kind of stuff today and we think, oh my gosh, terrorists. But look what they're doing over there in such and such a land where they're hanging people's heads on sticks to intimidate the population. You think that's something new? It's been going on for thousands of years. They took his head and they were all night escaping through the plain. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, Here's the head of Ishbosheth, <laughs> the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. And the Lord has avenged my lord the king this day of Saul and his descendants. But David answered Rechab and Baana, his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Berethite, and said to them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adversity, when someone told me, saying, Look, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good news, I arrested him, and I had him ex executed in Ziglag. <laughs> the one who thought that I would give him a reward for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous person in his own house on his bed? Therefore shall I not now require his blood at your hand and remove you from the earth? <laughs> he does the same thing. So David, oh man, blows me away, commanded his young men and they executed him. They cut off their hands and feet and hung them by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Isposheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner in Hebron. So now we have the end of Isposheth and we have the end of the threat to David towards the throne. Why do you think they hanged him by the pool in Hebron? You think it was a message? You think it was maybe you better get in line or this might happen to you too? I think so. That was a very common practice. They did it with Goliath. They did it with Saul. They did it with many of the people that were captive. Not only the Philistines and the parasites and the mosquito bites and all the other ites that lived out there that were wicked people. Even the children of Israel did that. I think sometimes when we think about David and Judah and Israel, we think of kind of a peace, peaceful people, gentle people. 
It's not the case at all. So now David, well, there's nothing holding him back now. He can unite Israel and Judah together as one and rule and reign over it. And so David, he wants to get to Jerusalem, and that's part of his goal right now. He's in Hebron, but he wants to get to Jerusalem, and that's where he wants to establish his capital for his new reign. Come to find out that Jerusalem sits up on the top of a mountain. You always go up to Jerusalem. And it was inhabited by people that had been inhabiting it for a long, long time. And it was kind of right on the border of Judah and Israel. So it kind of straddled the border. Perfect location. How much time do I have? 15 minutes? So it says, All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. <laughs> Also, in times past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore, all of the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. <clears throat> David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. Pretty long reign. Now in Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all of Israel and Judah. So that first seven and a half years, he was the king of Judah. And then he becomes the king of Judah and Israel, and he reigns 33 years over both of them. And the king and his men, they went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. That's the people that were living there. They were the inhabitants of the land who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. He took all the people that were old and sick and blind and lame, and he stuck them all up by the gate, thinking that David would never come in and slaughter all these poor, helpless people. It would deter him from doing it. Well, I think I've read enough about David to know that he does some pretty crazy things. Verse 7, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. Another word for Jerusalem. And that is now called the city of David. Now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. This was an irrigation ditch. A uh, covert, if you will. Big covert. That's how they got in. They kind of snuck their way in through this little covert thing. And as a matter of fact, I found out the other day that there's still ruins of this very covert still there. You can go and, and you can see it. That's pretty cool, huh? So David dwelt in the stronghold. And he called it the city of David. And David built all around from the Milo and inward. So David went on and he became great and the Lord God of hosts was with him. David's doing pretty well for himself. Now we got a king that lives down in Tyre. His name is Hiram. The king of Tyre, he sends messages to David. He wants to make a treaty with him. David's got quite the reputation. So he sends him cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. So David knew 
that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. Now, there's a lot of important information right there. David knew that the Lord had called him. How did he know? He knew because of the fruit that was being born through his calling. So that's one of the things I'll always ask people when they say, I'm called to be the greatest evangelist in the world. Okay, can you show me any fruit of that calling? Well, no. Has anybody got saved under your ministry? Well, no, but I'm working on it. Okay, the fruit tells the story, always. You want to know if a ministry is called by God, if it's successful? What's the fruit? David sees fruit. He knows God has called him. He's confident now. He's established him as king. David's not taking credit for any of this. And that he, God, has exalted his kingdom, God's kingdom, for the sake of his, God's people, Israel. David's got some pretty deep spirituality going on inside of him. But then what's he do? He turns around and starts making stupid decisions again. Just like that. What does he do? He took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. He didn't have enough in Hebron. He had to have some Jerusalem wives to go with him. So he took more after he'd come from Hebron. Also, more sons and daughters were born to David. Now, these are the names of those who were born to him. Blah, and blah, and blah, and blah, and blah. And blah, blah, and blah, blah. <laughs> now when the Philistines heard that they had appointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it, and he went down to the stronghold. And the Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? The Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to Baal Perizim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me, like a breakthrough of water. Therefore he named that place Baal Perizim, the master of breakthrough. But notice what word he uses there. Not the Lord. He uses the term Baal, which was the God that the Philistines worshipped. Interesting. So the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephim. And David inquired of the Lord and he said, you shall not go up. Circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, and then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you and strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Strange battle plan there, isn't it? Go hide in the trees. And when you hear the sound of the marchers going by, you're going to ambush them. We're not going to come down on the field of battle and, you know, run into each other like the typical battles would go. We're going to outsmart them. We're going to preserve our soldiers. And we're going to drive them back. And so here you have a great example of David building his reputation. As a matter of fact, you might remember earlier <coughs> that he had 600 men with him in the cave. 600. And he lost about 22 of them in that one battle. We're not going to go through chapter 6, but just look at the first verse. So again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel. Now how many has he got? 30,000. He's gone from 600 to 30,000. He is a pretty powerful guy at this point. And why is he powerful? 
because of God. God has blessed him with all of his faults, with all of his bad choices, with all of his woman problems. God is still using him in a mighty way. He's still teaching David lessons. And uh, again, I, most of these kids, I didn't mention their names because you really don't see or hear about them beyond this point. They had really no effect on the history of Israel. So we're going to park right there. I'm very tired of talking. So we'll pick up in chapter 6 next week. Is there any... Uh, well, let's go ahead and pray first. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you tonight for these stories. They're really exciting to, to relive them uh, together as we read through your word. And, and just to see the humanity, to see the viciousness, to see the, the, the victory. Um, it's just amazing to us, God, uh, that we can sit here tonight and perhaps maybe be a little overcritical of ourselves. But when we see these things, it kind of gives us encouragement, Lord, that, that we're not so far away after all that we can draw close to you, and that you love us, and you forgive us, and you reinstate us. You, you put us where you want us to be as long as we are willing, as long as we yield. And that's my prayer for us tonight, Lord, as we leave this room, that we would continue to yield to your Spirit, that we would continue to discover your call in our lives. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.